Hey everybody, my name is Jen Lewis and I am the Fundraising and Outreach Manager here at the Point Cabrillo Lightkeepers Association. In today's video, we are going to introduce you to the people who came before us and take a peek at the history of the Point Cabrillo Light Station and the Mendocino Coast. We're going to learn today with Pam, Sue, Heather, and Katie, our incredible education team out here at the Light Station. Let's jump right in. Hi, I'm Pam Huntley and welcome back to Point Cabrillo Light Station State Historic Park. We're happy to share with you some of the stories that make this such a cool historic park. We want to start with the oldest stories, the stories of the first people, the Native Americans or indigenous people who lived here for thousands of years before us. And in this area of the Mendocino Coast, they were called the Pomo people. Now I want to start first by you noticing I'm not Pomo. And what I learned, I didn't learn all from my grandmother, who learned it from her grandmother, who learned it from hers. Instead, I learned a lot from books that were written by people like me, who wrote down what they thought. And like, thankfully, I learned some from the native Pomo that lived of this area and who have shared their stories. So to give you an example of how maybe we didn't get all the information right is even in the name Pomo that we named them all because that was a group of Pomo people that lived on the north side of Clear Lake. When the first explorers came there, they said, who are you? And they said, Pomo, which in their language meant people. So they said, yes, you're the Pomo Indians. And they're like, yes, we're people. And that's all it meant in their language. But actually there were 70 different groups, seven different languages that we now lumped together as Pomo because they had similar ways of living in this place for thousands and thousands of years. So we're talking about the Pomo that were here for thousands of years before us. But are there still Pomo people? Sure, they're in your schools. They're wearing sneakers and eating pizza and riding their bikes just like us. But their ancestors are who we're talking a little bit more about today. And right up here was what they called Ditso Cell where the Pomos from over by Willits, called the Mitome Pomos, used to come here for their summer camps, where they would travel here every summer to get away from the heat inland. So there were some local Pomo tribes that lived here year round, but a lot came to the coast for the summertime. They did lived in these small family groups, maybe about the same size as your class today. They didn't have to have a big tribe because California is the land of abundance, such a variety of food. They weren't dependent on a herd of bison to get them through freezing winters. The Pomos are famous to this day for their baskets. They are some of the best basket makers in the world. I hope someday you can go to the Grace Hudson Museum in Ukiah, where they have the best collection of Pomo baskets. Basketry was taught from mother to daughter, the traditions, and the women were the main basket makers. Baskets were used for every part of their life. They lived in upside down baskets. They ate on flat baskets. They carried their babies in baskets. They even collected and cooked their acorn mush, the main staple of their diet, made in baskets. So they would go to the beautiful tree to collect the acorns. They would grind them in something like a mortar and pestle, something like this kind of ones, that then they used the rounded rocks for grinding the acorns up and then rinsing them and even cooking in baskets that they would do by putting the acorn mush, taking hot rocks from the fires, stirring really quickly to heat up. So baskets is their way of life. These are some baskets from my family. This is called a coil basket from the Northwest. And they always would look at the bottom for how a basket was made. This is a basket that was given to my father in the Sierra Nevadas when he was a boy. It's called a spoke basket that they wove around. 
I hope someday you'll get to the museum to see their beautiful collection of baskets. The women were the caretakers of the plant community, over 6,000 different plants that they used. And they said that to this day, they are surrounded by friends and family. So plants were used for food. They were also used for making cordage. And I will put uh, a video after this one if you would like to try and make rope. These make great bracelets and anklets and I will teach you how to do that in another video. So this is with the iris twine, the beautiful Douglas irises that we have blooming out here, beautiful purple that is used and I will show you that in another video. So plants was a main part of their diet, even plants from the ocean, seaweed was a big part of their diet, but every day was the acorn mush. Now, the men were the ones that caretake the animal community. There were over 150 different mammals that were used. They had 50 different kinds of fish, 500 different birds that were used by the Pomo people. All of these things were part of their diet. The things were part of their diet. The land of abundance. Imagine a whole hillside of elk moving. It looked like the whole hill was moving. Salmon so thick, it looked like you could walk across on their backs as they went up the river. They talked about that when a, they fired a gun, so many ducks and geese would take out for the lake, they would blacken out the sun for minutes. Such a time of abundance. And in part, I think it's how they used these animals, their friends and family, as they called them. For when they killed a deer, did they just take just the best part of the deer? I know you're shaking your head no, because they used every part of that deer they could. So they used the animals and plants and lived with them for thousands and thousands of years. So trade was a big part of the Pomo's life with the neighboring indigenous tribes on all sides of them. They traded the sea salt from the ocean were the important things that comes from volcanoes, obsidian, to make their arrowheads. So they would trade up and down for bows, for all different things. And they had a form of money, it was clamshell necklaces. And the clamshells had to be from Bodega Bay. And they had to cut and sand each of those round discs. And then they had to put a hole. So this is called a pump drill. And you use it by pumping. Originally, there was a different drill, but when the Spanish came and taught them, this was an easier way to make a hole to go through each of those little tiny discs. You know, we've been talking about the Pomos living here for thousands and thousands of years, but that's just numbers. I wanted to show you what that means with our timeline. We made this so that each of these little knots represents a hundred years. And so probably us settlers have been on the coast about this long, around 170 years or so. I want to show you how long the Pomos were here before that time. There's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, 11,000, 500 years is how long the Pomo's ancestors lived in the same place without running out of anything. It's my wish that we learn some of those lessons so this will be here for our children and our children's children after that. You know, I have been talking about this timeline and it goes on. As we said, there are still Pomo people and I have seen this bird dance that they do with a flicker mask over the top of their eyes. And they were so good. He had a little tiny bone flute in his mouth and he flicked his tail feathers. I swear I was watching a bird when they danced. And I've been told I've got to go to the strawberry festival that happens in the spring where the women wear these beautiful abalone headdresses. This is what I hope you learn to do is to find other people who have indigenous ancestors in their heritage to learn from their stories of how their people lived in a land for thousands and thousands of years. Hi everybody, my name's Katie and I'm here to let you in on a secret. 
Over a hundred years ago, right here on this very spot, there used to be a thriving town, one that's almost forgotten today and that your parents have probably never even heard of. That town was called Pine Grove. It was named after a beautiful grove of Bishop and Bolander Pines that used to grow here. This picnic basket is just like the ones people used to take in the old days to the famous Sunday picnics at Pine Grove. It's filled with clues about how life was back then. Well, I'm sitting here in front of the Kearns house. This is right near the old center of town. And the original Kearns house burned down recently. So this one here is newly rebuilt to look much like the original. There are some modern additions like public restrooms. Take a look at these old photographs. Do you notice any similarity to today's Kearns house? If you look around us now, there are no other houses, just a few lasting clues left by the people who used to live here. Like these cypress trees. Did you notice them in the photograph? Early settlers planted them in a row to protect their homes from the wind. Fortunately, some people wrote their stories down and much of what we know about Pine Grove today comes from sources like Margaret Brinsing Pritchard. Margaret's daughter, Susan, wrote a book about her mom's stories. You can find this book at the Fort Bragg Library. And if you're interested in local history, a good place to know about is the Kelly House Museum in Mendocino. Well, about the Kearns brothers, Here's what Margaret had to say. The thing I remember most, and this was really silly, was that old Dick and Josh had rocking chairs. And along on the windowsill, they would pick up these apples from their little orchard. And then they would set them on the windowsill. And when us kids came, they would peel the apples for us. Oh, we just loved them. This is when I was seven or eight years old. Well, back in 1852, the first white person to make Pine Grove their home was Captain Peter Thompson, an adventurer and mountain man from Scotland. Then more settlers came and Pine Grove became a small town with farms and ranches and a downtown. In the earlier days, there was a general store and a hotel with saloon, a tannery for making leather and a barber shop. This map shows how town looked in the 1920s. A second hotel housed lumber workers and next door there was a dance hall, a racetrack, and a baseball diamond. You can see there was a creamery, a medical building, and a bull barn. That's where they kept the teams that pull, pulled the logs out of the woods. The Pine Grove Brewery was extremely popular among thirsty mill and lumbermen all the way from Albion to Kibicella. It produced 10,000 gallons of beer and soda water every year, and its customers praised the drink as an excellent article and as a fresh glass of cool, refreshing lager. Mmm, doesn't that look good? And we're using non-alcoholic apple cider. Pine Grove also grew wheat and potatoes for sale. They raised sheep and cows that produced milk, meat, and butter. Well, the Casper Creek Lumber Company put a mill on Casper Beach in 1861. Pine Grove was already there right on the coastal highway just one mile south and it was four miles north of the biggest town far and wide. It was known in those days as Mendocino City. Well, back in the late 1800s, the roads didn't look anything the way they do now. They were muddy and bumpy. Most people traveled by foot, or they might take a horse and wagon. Remember, there were no automobiles until the early 1900s. There was a stagecoach, and it passed through Pine Grove twice every day on its way between Mendocino and Casper. Then it continued on to Fort Bragg and Westport. That trip took around eight hours, and that was one way. However you got from one place to another, 
It took a long time and it was difficult back then. In some ways, this was good for pine groves because they were located right on the center of the coast. This made it a popular spot for visitors and it was the perfect place to stop and rest. The thing people remember most about Pine Grove were the big parties and celebrations like the May Ball. It was a big dance they had every year on May 1st. People would dress up in their finest clothes and they come from up and down the coast. The newspapers would report over a hundred tickets sold and visitors came from as far as San Francisco. There were lots of flowers decorating the hall. There was live music. People would be dancing until dawn and they even had a midnight supper. The 4th of July was another big celebration at Pine Grove. They'd have picnics as well as a lot more dancing. They'd even have horse races and they'd have baseball games. Here's a picture of the local Casper and Pine Grove baseball team. And here are the picnickers from the 4th of July in 1897. In the early 1900s, the town of Pine Grove began to fade away. Work slowed at the mill and prohibition meant that alcohol sales were now illegal, so the brewery closed. Road improvements like the new bridge over Russian Gulch made the trip between Fort Bragg and Mendocino so much shorter that hardly anyone stopped in Pine Grove anymore. And then on top of that, they moved Highway 1 further inland so it didn't go through Pine Grove anymore. With fewer visitors and fewer jobs, the town slowly disappeared. But then there was something new that started in 1909. Perhaps that's why the road here is called Point Cabrillo Drive and not Pine Grove Road. Sue and also Heather will tell you what happened next. Hello, Sue here. And you've been time traveling with Pam, learning about the Pomo who lived here a long, 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 long time ago. And then you got to meet Katie, who taught you about the people that lived here at Pine Grove. And now I'm here to set the stage for what we're gonna learn about next. So I'm down by these incredible houses because if your dad worked for the lighthouse surface, it meant he worked really hard because he would have been chosen to work down here not a rocky island isolated with a lighthouse where you'd have to wait for your groceries and your mail to come monthly or be stranded by yourself with no kids around. Down here there was a few more families than you would expect and I'm going to let you take a moment to scan and see how many houses we have here and then you'll know how many families lived here at Point Cabrillo. If you counted one, two, and three, then you are right. And you might not be able to see, but there's one of the houses is bigger than the others. And that's the one right here that's the head light keeper's house. Had a little bit more rooms and a couple extra bedrooms upstairs. So if your dad worked for the first assistant light keeper, he would have been in this house back here behind me. They were all built in 1909 and they were built from old growth redwood and Douglas fir trees, which is probably why they're still here now. Things look a lot different than they did back when the first light keepers were here. In this yard here would have been beautiful gardens of gladiolas and roses and dahlias and sweet peas. So we're gonna go behind the house and learn some more about how everything was here back then on the North Coast. Here we are behind the house and this outbuilding here was where the coal was stored. It was called anthracite coal, and it was delivered once a year all the way from Pennsylvania. In addition to this building storing the coal, it was also the place where garden tools were kept as well. If you were a kid back then, your chore would be to get the coal from here and bring it into the house, the kitchen and the dining room and the parlor, because it was used for cooking and for keeping the house warm. And out here would be extensive gardens filled with beets and corn and potatoes and string beans and peas. And as a child, your chores would be to weed and water and harvest the vegetables from the garden, 
the light keepers also kept chickens and rabbits and cows and sometimes pigs. So you'd also have to probably milk the cow and take care of the animals as well. So in a moment, we'll go inside into what would have been your house. But because we're being detectives of history, you're gonna to need to get your sharp eyes ready because I'm gonna ask you to look for certain things in each room and I'll need your help to find them. Are you ready to go see? Come on, let's go in. All right, take a moment to look around and guess which room we're starting out in. If you guessed washroom or what we call laundry room today, then you're right. You would have been responsible for doing your family's laundry. Many steps had to happen in order for that to take place. You'd have to come over here and use the washboard to get the dirt out, rinse it underneath here, wring out the excess water, and then hang up things to dry. Can you imagine how long it took for things to dry on a foggy, wet winter day? Do you think there's a lot of space in here to do your laundry? A lot different than what we do nowadays. So here we are in the kitchen, which would have been your kitchen had your family lived here. And we can take a moment to look at some of the old tiny type of devices and things that they had here, like a flour sifter. And then I wouldn't have known what this was unless I learned about it here, a butter churner. You would pour the milk in there and then turn the handle to turn the milk into butter. Who would have thought about that? And then over here, if your dad or your mom drank coffee, you'd have to hand grind the beans for them to make coffee. And then when you milk the cow, you'd have to fill up that whole big jug right there with milk and carry that in. And then this incredible stove where your mom made the meals and helped feed your family every day. But kind of a small space to try to cook, prepare fish that your family caught, to can vegetables that you harvested from your garden and the meat that you prepared. So we'll go into the dining room so you can see where your family most likely ate most of its meals. So here we are in what was the dining room. And we don't have the table here and the chairs because this is a museum for people to see what everything looked like back then. But there's a photo over here that shows exactly how the dining room used to look back when your family would eat meals in here. And so down here we have that anthracite coal. And this isn't even full all the way. And I'm here to tell you, it's pretty heavy. And the amazing thing about this coal is that it was a clean burning coal and also quite a clean coal because there's no black stuff on my hands from handling it. So that was a, a, a good thing about using this type of coal for all the heating and the cooking that had to be done. At least in addition to carrying it in from the outbuilding, you didn't have to go wash your hands before you did the next chore. And then when your family lived here in the 1930s, electricity had come to Point Cabrillo in 1935. But what do you think families did before that? I'm standing near something that would give you a hint of how they used to have light here. This is a kerosene lantern. And the wick usually comes up in here and would get lit here. And another one of your jobs would have been to clean, they call this outer glass, a chimney. And it gets a little uh, dirty with the soot from the candle being lit. So one of your jobs, like your dad's, would have been to clean the glass to make sure that the light of the candle would come through even brighter. But a lot different to eat your meals by a kerosene lantern than electrical light, don't you think? We're so lucky these days. So you're gonna to need to get your sharp eyes tuned in because we're about to head into the hallway and I want you to see if you can find out where your family's cell phone is. Yes, that's right. They didn't have cell phones back then. Instead, you would have had to use, and your family would have had to use a phone like this, cranking it up like this, talking into this piece over here and using this piece up against your ear. Your mom might have called Wilma, can I have that recipe for the banana bread? And if you wanted to be talking to a friend, that wasn't the kind of phone that you used back then. The lighthouse service people needed to be able to call in in case of emergency. 
And also there weren't telephone lines here yet. So if you called a friend, not only would you get charged to call the friend, if they called you, you would get charged as well. So very different from the way that we have phones these days, that's for sure. So next we'll go into the parlor. And if you didn't know what a parlor is, it's kind of like a living room. And being that there wasn't a lot of activity at night back then, other than the other families that lived here, your family would come in here and spend some time. And take a moment to look around and notice what you as kids might have done and what your mom might have done if she was hanging out in this room. So yes, there's toys and blocks and things, but unlike what we have here on our carpet, you would have made sure to put the toys away. Because Flora, a girl that used to live here years ago, she never left her toys out because there might be the white glove inspection. And you're wondering, what's a white glove inspection? The lighthouse service people would send people here on surprise to inspect the houses with a white glove to make sure there was no dirt or dust and to make sure that things were picked up and tidy and in order. And so in addition to playing with toys, maybe your mom would read a story to you or you may have listened to music from the CD player. I know they didn't have CD players. Instead, they had what was called a Victrola or a phonograph and it played records, which kind of looks like a giant CD for those of you that don't know what records are. And your mom might have done some sewing or some spinning of wool or some quilting, and you would just enjoy your evenings here because during the day, dad would be resting most likely and you'd want to get out and play outdoors instead of making a bunch of noise when he needed to rest. And then in here was your dad's office. See where his laptop is? I know, he didn't have one. He used a typewriter instead. And that's where he would type up reports that he would send to the lighthouse service or to make requests for different items needed for painting and various jobs around here at the property. And then let's go out here into the hallway again. We'll pass by what would have been the mudroom front entrance to the house. As a kid, you'd want to make sure to take your boots off before you came into the house because remember that inspection? That's right. So let's review historians what it would have been like to be a kid back then. You would have had chores like gathering the coal from the back building and would have helped weed and water and harvest vegetables from the garden, take care of the animals, milk the cow, help with the laundry, but also have some time outside to play. A lot different from the children of the Pomo and the children that lived during Pine Grove time. And soon you'll learn even more about what your dad and the other light keepers did and more about the lighthouse from Heather. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Heather. I hear you've been time traveling through the incredible stories of this place. Well, the stories of the light keepers, in fact, the stories of the Mendocino Coast wouldn't be complete without the lighthouse. So follow me and we'll continue our journey into the time of the Point Cabrillo light station. Looking at our beautiful lighthouse, the first thing you might notice is the mesmerizing flash of its light. Let's count the seconds between flashes. Are you ready? Okay. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi, ten Mississippi. That's ten seconds between flashes. There's a good reason for that, actually. Before sailors had GPS to tell them where they were, they had to rely on other ways. The ten seconds at Point Cabrillo is something we call a signature, and that's how you knew you were here. But if you were at another lighthouse, for example, it might be two flashes every six seconds. This lens is called a Fresnel lens after the French engineer Augustine Jean Fresnel, who figured out how to use prisms to focus a light source back in the 1800s. Yep, you're looking at a whole bunch of prisms, 150 of them actually. There are four sides and each side has several prisms arranged around a bullseye shape. They bend the light and shine them toward the horizon. Just this lens alone weighs about 6,000 pounds. That's three tons. And it traveled a long way to get here, all the way from England where it was made, down around Cape Horn at the southernmost tip of South America and all the way up to California. 
The lens was originally only lit from dusk till dawn, but what about during the daytime? Maybe you've noticed the colors on the buildings here. Look at those bright red roofs. This is not just a snazzy paint job. This was meant to be seen from a ship. Another signature. We call this one a day mark. Why do you suppose there's a lighthouse here? Well, this is the perfect place for a lighthouse. The land juts out to sea enough that you can see the light both up and down the coast and out to sea. Because there were ships traveling up and down the coast carrying both goods and people. And there were many shipwrecks. In 1908, they finally built the lighthouse and it was first lit in 1909. This lighthouse was built for ships traveling up and down the coast. Its light shines for over 13 miles out to sea. Some other lighthouses were built for landfall. Those were for the ships coming from across the ocean and had even bigger lenses and taller towers, like the one at Point Arena a little bit south of us. That's when you'd wanna shout, land ho, as you spotted the coastline for the first time. The flash of the light and the colors of the buildings couldn't always be seen during the foggy times. And it's foggy in Mendocino a lot. So these foghorns would warn ships when there was land nearby. They were so loud they could be heard all the way to Mendocino. Like the flashes of the lights and the unique colors, each foghorn signal was different. The foghorn at Point Cabrillo was housed inside. These are the huge engines and air compressors that used to be where our gift shop and museum is now. As a matter of fact, they call this the fog signal building. Hey kids, do you know what a foghorn sounds like? Let's practice our best foghorn impression. Here's mine. Wow! Come on everybody, let's go inside. Wow, check out this original visitor log. If you were stationed here and you had friends and family visiting, they would have signed this log. Look at this poster of the shipwrecks. 100 years of marine disasters on the Mendocino coast. It's a good thing that they put a lighthouse here. The day-to-day -day lives of the lightkeepers were more work than play. If you were on the night shift, your first job is to fill this five gallon kerosene can out there at the oil house. Oh gosh, when it's full, it weighs 40 pounds. And don't forget your flashlight. So next, these had to be carried all the way up three flights of narrow stairs to the lamp room. Now that the fuel is taken care of, it's time to light the lamp. Here's our lighter. These are wicks. And these wicks are very similar to the ones that were in the lamp room. In fact, that's why the, light, why the light keepers were called wickies. They had to trim the wicks so they wouldn't get the glass all smoky and sooty. If you think cleaning a glass lantern would be a hassle, imagine having to clean the lighthouse lens and all 150 of its prisms. Another job was to crank up the clockworks. This had to be done several times every night. There was a cable with a weight on it around this drum and you would wind it up and it would slowly come back down turning the lens. The chores didn't end there. All that shiny brass had to be polished, not to mention painting. In the salty sea air, buildings had to be repainted regularly. And of course, in those days, you couldn't just take a quick trip to the hardware store or call the repairman. Maintenance was an ongoing part of the daily duties of the light keepers. Well, my friends, we can't talk about lighthouses without a little adventure. One of my favorite stories about the lighthouse was in 1960 when Bill Owens was the head light keeper here. As the story goes, February 8th, 1960, the Coast Guard received word of a big storm brewing that was headed their way. 
By February 9th, strong winds and huge swells were hitting Point Cabrillo. As the storm got worse, they evacuated to the assistant light keeper's house. That's the one that's higher up the hill and further from the sea. While they were hunkered down inside for the night, the storm raged on, and at one point, looking out the window, the light from the lens shone on a wave taller than the lighthouse before it came crashing back down over the bluff. When they emerged the next day, there was significant damage. The bluffs were covered with sand, gravel, and even boulders. The massive waves had crashed through the doors and flooded the inside. The water had lifted the engines and compressors off the floor and rocks and gravel were everywhere. But throughout it all, the light continued to shine. In 1972, there was an automated light put outside the lamp room and the beautiful Fresnel lens was turned off. Like so many lighthouses, this could have been the end, but many people love lighthouses. Point Cabrillo was restored thanks to volunteers and skilled craftspeople doing thousands of hours of work. Today, the Point Cabrillo Lighthouse is maintained in all of its glory by the Auxiliary Coast Guard. Their volunteer work keeps the light shining bright for all to see. We're so glad you could join us to hear some of the stories of this place, a place in this area that's had names of Ditso Cell, Pine Grove, Point Cabrillo Light Station, California State Historic Park. And we have so many more stories to share. The story of the frolic tells the tale of a fast clipper sailing ship, of a famous captain of the opium trade, and of the California gold rush. It also tells of the discovery of Mendocino gold, our giant redwoods. To the stories of the families that lived here as light keepers and the Coast Guard, and to the California Coastal Conservancy that did a land swap, preventing this property from being developed into private homes in a neighborhood, and instead made it historic, not to mention the Auxiliary Coast Guard, who volunteers to keep that precious jewel shining, and but of course, California State Parks and Point Cabrillo Lightkeepers Association. And there's the story of the volunteers who put in thousands of hours of work here and they work in the gift shop and they help lead tours. And our sister organizations, the Marine Protected Area, California Fish and Wildlife, the Native Plant Society and the Audubon Society, all of whom help maintain and preserve this place. We so hope this makes you want to learn more of your own story, the stories that make you who you are today. I believe that learning the stories from your family and your community will make you a richer person and help us to make wiser decisions in the future. We hope you'll come to visit us here at Point Cabrillo and maybe be part of our story too. Thank you to our wonderful team of educators, Katie, Heather, Pam, and Sue. And thank you to our 2020 Point Gabriel Lightkeepers Association Board of Directors, Harold, Ruth, Sarah, Scott, Steve, Tanya, and Warren. You guys are amazing. And thank you to all of you for watching and sharing this video. Come out to visit us sometime soon at the Point Gabriel Light Station in Northern California.